Welcome to World of DAS, a show for data enthusiasts. I'm your host, Warren Hoffman, CEO of SafeGraph and GP of Flex Capital. For more conversations, videos, and transcripts, visit safegraph.com slash podcasts. Hello, fellow data nerds. My guest today is Matt Kaminsky. Matt is the editor-in-chief of Politico. He was the founding editor of Politico Europe, and prior to that, he worked at the Wall Street Journal, where he won an overseas press club prize for coverage in the Ukraine crisis in 2015. Matt, welcome to World of DAS. Oren, it's great to be here. Excited. Um, now, like pretty much all institutions, trust in journalism is at an all-time low. W what do you think is underlying, what's the underlying cause of that? I think it's pretty similar. I think in the media, we've been, uh, um, you know, we were one of the first industries, I would say, that was disrupted by the, um, uh, you know, the rise of the internet in the late 1990s. Uh, and I think we're also one of the first institutions to really feel the kind of the, I would call it even the deinstitutionalization of our uh, culture and our politics and, 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 and society. Um, I, you know, it's, I find it paradoxical in a sense, since I think journalism as such has never been better. And uh, they are, uh, especially at the national and international level. I mean, I think, you know, sort of the, the dot-com revolution really blew up local media, and that's a great tragedy. But, you know, for national publications, for more specialized publications, you know, I think a lot of them are thriving, and there's a lot of amazing work being done. Um, and I just assume the distrust is exactly as uh, similar to the distrust in government institutions, um, in the sense that, you know, we were at least my generation, which is the same as your generation, was kind of raised to believe in, uh, you know, I'm, I'm too young for uh, for Walter Cronkite, but I definitely had Tom Brokaw and, and sort of Peter Jennings in my life uh, yep. uh, growing up. And, you know, we got several newspapers at home and that was the, the, the truth. And with the proliferation of everything, uh, uh, you know, there is no institution that can come close to playing the, the same role. But I... I think it's overstated as well. Um, people you, don't do trust. you think there's a uh, do you think there's like a any blame to be put on the media itself for some of this mistrust, this lack of trust? Well, I would say first of all, I think it's overstated. It's a little bit like people sort of who don't like their con who don't like Congress, but actually like their congressman. What I yeah. what I hear a lot is we don't like media writ large. But I love MSNBC, Fox News, depending on sort of where you live, or I love the Wall Street Journal, but everything else is, uh, I think people are still trusting the sources that, that they choose to trust. Um, is there a blame on the media? Of course. I mean, I think if we're uh, uh, being introspective, I, I do think that, you know, we've fallen prey to, um, uh, we become part of the problem in the polarization in this country, as opposed to uh, what I at least was raised uh, to see journalism as being, you know, the um, not always the purely objective arbiter of, of what's really going in the world, but being very careful to make sure that we try and rise above it. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, another problem is everyone's a journalist these days, you know, um, here we are on this podcast. That right, good point. You, you sort of started, everyone can publish on and reach potentially millions of sort of people. So, um, I think people are in some ways right to distrust what they see out there and will be increasingly so since uh, as technology, you know, takes the leaps and bounds that, that, that it does. Do you think trust can like, is it, is it just fated to be low journal, trust in journalism for, for a very long time? Or do you think there's something that can happen where the trust in the press can rise again? I mean, maybe I'm um, seeing things a little bit, you know, <laughs> Being at Politico, I sort of see myself and look at the world of politics and see a lot of similarities. You know, there's, as you mentioned, you know, you don't like the institutions of Congress or even the White House, but you like individual parties or certainly individual people. Uh, so I think with the media, um, people do trust the sources that they uh, they rely on. Um, I think also like with politicians, um, uh, there are probably moments of great national crisis, you know, uh, God forbid a war. Uh, where people really do come to media. I mean, I, I, during the, the COVID pandemic, you know, we all saw record readership. People were turning to us to understand what was going on since people were just so hungry for, for information. And then 
a lot of disinformation went out into the world and, and then they sort of you know as a pox in all houses it's the media's fault but I, I think that's a little bit of a simplistic reading i think people do really um uh, uh are first of all audiences are smart um people know they can tell quality from garbage most of the time and you know at least in my profession people who are committed to doing this professionally and who are have a, a certain standard are are doing very well both as a business and in terms of the um you know having the uh, confidence and the faith uh, and the sort of of their audiences you know we, we do have millions of people who turn to politico every month to uh, every day who to, 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 to really understand what's going on in american politics G getting a story right is really hard i mean i have of of the complex stories that I've had inside knowledge of, there's never been one that is like even remotely accurate. Um, I mean, it's really it must be just really really hard to actually get a real story out and stuff like that. And usually, there at least I found that the ones that I'm familiar with are riddled with errors. There's lots of things that are factually incorrect. Often, like they completely miss the story because somebody's trying to misdirect them in some sort of way or uh, try to get their own thing, uh, their own point across and stuff like that. Uh, it must be just so frustrating and difficult to be a reporter. How do you guard against that? Well, it's, it's also frustrating to read about yourself. And I've, uh, I've been in, in the same position that, that, that you have been on. And you're like, oh, I cannot believe they got that thing wrong. Or it's <laughs> Uh, so complaining about the media is is uh, <laughs> one of our oldest, uh, <laughs> you know, habits. Uh, um, look, there's also a lot of bad journalism out there, and this is where you know, if you're talking about you know media self criticism, I do sort of think that you know, as in any industry, there are there's good and bad. You have bad cars and good cars, and then there are bad journalists and good journalists. There's a lot of lazy journalism, which is uh, not even quite the same as sort of bad journalism. It's it's just. Uh, um, it, it, it is just the reporters who don't do their work. I think it is on us, especially us who are in positions in later generations, who are in positions of power in media to make sure that um, the uh, values uh, that we were taught um, and that the uh, habits that were ingrained in us are passed on. And this is where I do see something that does worry me. I, again, I you know came into the profession about almost 30 years ago and coming to the profession then. And this was a world still, you know, pretty much pre-internet, you know, several national newspapers, several uh, television channels that the journalism had evolved um, so much. Uh, and remember journalism used to be a profession where you, you barely needed a high school degree. And I'm actually, you don't need any really degree to be a great journalist now in any case, but it was really professionalized hit a peak with Watergate. And I think there were generation after generation really learned how to do this properly. With the rise of the internet, the disruption to local media, the places where you were taught how to do proper reporting are fewer than there used to be. And it's a lot easier to become famous and to make a name for yourself in journalism than in the past, because you get one thing out there, you've got an amazing Twitter following. So I do think there's been a, a um, kind of, a, uh, I think our standards may have sort of um, weakened over uh, in this new era that we live in, which is obviously the, the digital era. It, um, it does seem like most media, especially media that covers politics like Politico, most media is has a very clear partisan bent. Um, there's a clear place where they're trying to focus um, on the political spectrum. Politico does seem to be an exception to that. Is that like a conscious choice where you're consciously saying, okay, we don't want to be a, you know, center left or this or that or this other thing? Or is it just kind of evolved that way? Uh, it was a very conscious choice from, from the beginning. I think we were saying, you know, if we're going to be the ESPN of politics, uh, you can't be a fan for one team or the other team because you yep. have to alienate all the other fans. Uh, uh, you know, that's, oh, that's a good analogy, right? It's not like ESPN is little, rooting for the y Yankees and against the Red Sox or something, right? Because right, then, yeah, then you lose half your audience. You never. Yep. I mean, the Boston Globe will root for the Red, Red Sox, and that's yep. kind of true to what their audience is. Yep. Which gets to the you know the other reason why we uh, think nonpartisanship is so important is that um, it enables us to do the kind of journalism that we can do better. 
So if reporters get ac- need to have access to Marjorie Taylor Greene one day and AOC another day, and if either side can say, ah, I'm not going to talk to you because we think you're in the tank for the other uh, team. And by the way, they, they still say that because this has also become a kind of form of politics in this country to just kind of dismiss uh, yeah. critics as being uh, partisan hacks. Um, but for us, it's really important to make sure that we get access to the people that we need to get access to. Um, I would say this is um, part of this is new and part of this has always been here. You know, I, I don't think, I actually do not think good reporters, the best reporters are motivated by um, an ideological agenda. Uh, I'll tell you why. Um, uh, this is a pretty competitive profession. To really win, to really be successful in this profession, you got to be seen as the one who gets the story, you know, and and uh, and you win by getting the story. You, you don't win by, we all have a political point of view. Uh, and it's pretty boring. I mean, I, I used to work for opinion pages, you know, for, for many years. I used to write opinion columns. And I think there's a great place for opinion journalism. And people really enjoy opinion journalism. When opinion journalism starts to kind of get into news journalism, I, I think it actually just deadens the product. Um, and uh, But, you know, there's other things besides kind of out and out partisan bias. There's kind of a worldview bias. You know, the, the New York Times has always had a certain worldview based on where it is, what kind of people it tends to hire. I do think they have amazing journalists there. They do an amazing job, but they reflect a certain sensibility, which is, an, you know, lack of a better phrase, an Upper West Side New York sensibility. The Wall Street Journal, which is, you know, based in New York too, actually has always had more of a kind of Midwestern sensibility, you know, that uh, we, we sort of, especially in the news report, we stick to the facts. We tell people uh, what's going on straight. People are making decisions about their stock portfolios based on what they read here. Um, so uh, I think that's always been the case. I think what has made it sharper is that as the business model has moved from being primarily reliant on print advertising to primarily reliant on subscriptions, uh, digital subscriptions, which is actually very healthy because it means people who are consuming the product are actually paying for it. The danger there is that you become captive to the audience that you have and you might yeah. think that you would lose um, you know, your business if you suddenly you know, really kind of change your editorial approach. And, uh, it's, it's, I mean, this is actually where editors play a very important role to make sure that you don't uh, uh, lose that. Because I, I still think the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal should be places, and Politico for that matter, should, should be places where people are reading the news and believing that what they're reading is. is Th- though it does seem that since the New York Times made that shift to subscriptions, you can you can you can almost point to that day at a at a point where they've always been known as being a little bit on the left but once they made that shift you could see it move more significantly to the left or would you not agree with that it's i i don't disagree uh it's also coincided with the kind of cultural change that's right in the country and yep. in the newsrooms so you have yep. a new generation of journalists coming into the newsroom those journalists uh you know, have a different background than uh, uh, the previous generation had, were, were also trained differently. You know, for in my generation to get a job at the New York Times, you probably needed to get a job first at the Charlotte Observer, if you were lucky, and learn how to do your craft, you know, covering the, the police beat. And maybe five, eight years later, you're lucky enough to get the New York Times. Now you come out of it uh, a bit more directly or from different places. The other thing which has changed in newsrooms that we have all kinds of jobs, that we didn't have before. You know, we have great audio teams and great interactives teams. We have sort of, we have, uh, you know, engineers that are my staff, you know, uh, uh, who are sort of coders. Uh, uh, so there are people who come in with a, um, again, a different uh, route into journalism than we had in the past. I think that's mostly a good thing, um, but it, it does, I think, make it harder to sort of, you uh, uh, to really make sure that you have sort of really the idea that um, uh, journalism is supposed to be uh, nonpartisan. I think all journalists are not nonpartisan. We're not supposed to be pushing a party agenda. We're supposed to be pushing an agenda. We will tell you something you did not previously know, and we will tell you in an engaging, interesting way. Now, you, you politicians, you know, 
seem, at least from my perspective, to be 95% performance, 5% substance. But I imagine the performance is the one that really drives clicks and views. How do you think about that when you're trying to figure out how to, what to cover? I mean, it's, again, we talked about earlier, the kind of the parallels between the political world and the media world. And again, it's, it's clearly, I think it actually speaks to all media, but it's something that we see all the time. Um, the one change in politics, and you hear it a lot from, you know, I was talking to a CEO somewhere and who's been doing this for a while, and he was up on Capitol Hill, and he was saying how, um, you know, 25 years ago to make your career on the Hill, the best way for a congressman or a senator is to really be a master of the policy subject areas. Yeah, you needed to kind of you know, be a good retail politician, obviously, but the way to succeed was you pushed legislation that mattered, that unlocked donors that you needed to come in to sort of support your reelection bid. Expertise was uh, highly valued in both elected office and in the support staff. And I think you've kind of seen a slight dumbing down of our politics, and maybe it's come with the dumbing down of our media and everything else, because the way to succeed now is to make a show of it. You know, uh, Trump is more brilliant at it, I think, than, than most people, but I think Obama benefited from it as well. You know, he was highly charismatic. He raised a lot of money from small donors. He did not need the kind of the guys with the big checks to, to get him to where he, to, to the White House. And it happens everywhere throughout. So, you know, but there are, there's politics. still, there's still plenty of people, you know, you, you can point to people on the left and the right today who are very substantive, um, like a, a, maybe someone like a Mike Gallagher on the right or somebody is a fairly substantive politician. It's not everybody is a, um, is performative or do you disagree? Like it's a, it's just like, it's just tilted so much to that. Mike Gallagher is a, a good example, but walk down the street and ask 10 people, uh, do you know who Mike Gallagher is? Right. You know nobody nobody will know who he is. Do you know right. who AOC is, right? Right, you know, right. So, yeah, they uh, know the more performative people. Those are the people with all the Twitter followers. Yeah. And those are people who are getting, you know, the, the donations coming in. They're the ones who are getting yep. the, the media coverage. And I got and the, 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 also the donations is important because now you can get all these, you can go direct to people, you can get these small dollar donations before those donations are coming in from a, a handful of elites. And so they probably really do want to 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 deal with the people on the policy side, whereas if you can go around those elites, it's probably you become much more powerful because then you have pots of money that you can divvy out. Yeah, and sometimes actually more democratic, you know, this, yeah. is, as this is kind of a, a good thing. But the idea that Matt Gates, who I don't think has a legislative win to his name, although I have not looked very closely, and is now seriously talking about running for the governor of Florida, where even know who 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 maybe someone on the floor delegation who has a better record in congress who would even be part of that conversation um you know how we cover it is a <laughs> you know we're an audience business we we have to produce work that people read and and uh we do uh, care about how many people read it and like everyone else our eyes our eyes are drawn to what's interesting you know yeah. trump is interesting uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and interesting. AOC is interesting. Uh, um, Joe Biden is not that interesting as a kind of media uh, personality, um, and yet he's president. So you know, yeah. I, I don't want to sort of. I don't think we live fully in the realm of just pure spectacle in Washington, and nothing substantive is happening here. Um, uh, but I think our politics has become much more of a spectacle, and uh, and the media you know, has helped that. Uh, but by media, I would say, you know, journalists plus just the institution of the internet and 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 the fact that, uh, you know, people are, are sort of consuming this everywhere and everyone is covering it, whether with video or, or, or with properly written, you know, stories. So speaking of big stories, I mean, you were on the inside of breaking the biggest story of 2022, which was the leak in the Dobbs case that upended Roe v. Wade. Right. What was it like being on the inside of that? And, um, <laughs> I imagine it was super stressful. Uh, it was it was a very uh, I mean you don't expect that to happen in a career all that often. And uh, when I first got uh, the call from um, one of one of the editors saying oh, we may have this, I should we pursue it? I said that's 
highly unusual. I doubt, well, this will go anywhere, but sure, why not? You know, right. but you'd never even heard of something similar ever happening before. I think, you know, this is a moment we've been talking with you a lot about, you know, uh, the spectacle of our politics and of the journalism and the decline and, um, you know, trust in media. But that was one of these moments where I think all the people in my team who worked very closely on the story actually felt the great responsibility we had in handling this. You know, um, and the most important thing was, well, there were several things that we were trying to figure out. Um, the most important thing is, is this thing real? Yeah, you know, th like, authenticating uh, this leak, right? That, that it actually authenticating was. Authenticating this yeah. leak, so, because. And how do you go about doing that? Because like, you start to call a bunch of people. They're gonna say, "I." They're gonna. They're just not gonna want to talk to you. I probably not gonna give you a, a yes or a no, right? Right. But I think we knew that if we had put out something that was, um, first of all, if it was wrong, it would be, um, you know, terrible for well, starting with me. Yeah. It'd be terrible for all for 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 Politico, but actually, I think it could be terrible for the country uh, as well because it would still kind of create the firestorm that it did and, and then the fallout from it. So I mean, we were very careful about getting, making sure that it's right. And, you know, uh, then you look very hard at the source and and try and, you know, understand um, why, who, how, uh, get that firmed up. Um, and then- and, their, sort of, and do you try to understand their motivation as well? I think that's something that we always try and understand with 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 sources, partly to sort of judge whether um, the information we've given is is accurate, and also to be aware ourselves of sort of why, you know, uh, they um, they are coming forward with the information. Ultimately, that's not the determinative thing for us. I mean, it's yeah. a, it's news, you know, and I think we felt that if we didn't, uh, we can't, we couldn't undo the fact that we knew this. Yep, uh, and we have an obligation to our readers to. To share things that we know, but we also know this would have gotten out somehow if, if we didn't um, put it out there and we felt that we could do it, which was really the second thing that we wanted to do is to put it out there in a way that was very um, uh, clean, uh, sorry, clear and and dispassionate that sort of no one could accuse us of saying that, you know, and there were all these theories about it, like this is someone in, you know, right wing jurist's office who's trying to lock in that right. outcome. So someone yep. from the left who's outraged by it and is trying to sort of undermine faith in, in the Supreme Court. So we really wanted to work very, very carefully to the way we presented the story. And if you read it, it's very kind of this is what we know. You, you have is, to protect your source, we essentially. And, well, this that that's that's also uh, sacred, you know. Yeah. And I think we're we're very glad that we've uh, su succeeded uh, in in doing that, and we have done everything possible to make sure that that we continue to to do that. The Supreme Court uh, ended up did do an investigation which they closed in january saying they cannot identify this this person um do you think like but, 20 years from now we'll we'll all know who this person is um or do you think it, it might go to this person's grave and your grave i think it would uh it is not a, i mean we are certainly not gonna uh, yeah it, it, it is it is this person or these persons right. i mean they have a they, they can do whatever they they want but but we made the commitment that 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 we made it was one of the more unusual and one of the most thorough uh, as you can imagine um vetting experiences because it was not like vetting uh you know leaking a supreme court uh opinion is unprecedented i think that you, you've had leaks a couple times including of roe v wade where someone was told a day before that the court was going to go this way but this is the first time you have a draft opinion Many That's months ahead of process, time. Yeah. Many months ahead of time, where the fact of us published, and this is, was weighing on me a lot at the time, was the fact of us publishing this, the fact of us sort of revealing this could potentially change the the outcome, you know, that was gonna happen if we had not uh divorced us. We also were very aware that, you know, is it in the public interest to to know? Uh, I think we again decided that it is because we do know it it is out there um and we have it and other people could um and then wait very much you know that this is uh news that will change public perceptions of the court arguably it would weaken the court which is one of our three branches of government yep. and sort of upend the the campaign which it did um you know in in in, in 2022 and this is again where 
we always come back to first principles. And, and I think uh, talking about journalism, at least here, I always say it's a very complicated world. It's a very fast changing world. We're not technologists. We're not sort of ethicists. We, um, we're not seeders. Uh, but we have to be a little bit of all those things. But fundamentally, you know, let's go back to the things that we were taught. You know, we uh, put out information that we have um, acquired in the process of doing reporting. We try and present it in ways that are clear, in a way that the audience um, accepts as being credible and doesn't think there's one side is pushing or the other side is pushing to your point about you know biased journalism i do think news journalism has to be beyond reproach i mean i'm nothing old-fashioned enough to believe that you know a um, a reader should not know your party card assuming you kind of carry one uh in reading your your uh reporting if they can tell where you yourself fall politically that that just diminishes the story by 50 percent um and but and, i mean then then it is somewhat of an indictment of journalism because outside of politico maybe a few other publications you can't really say that about most uh publications and most journals i think you can i agree with you on maybe if you're talking about publications as such you know if you look uh at certain publications the kinds of stories they choose to promote on front pages, where they sort of put the emphasis, the tone of headlines, you know, and that comes from the editing ranks and from the very top. I do think that most reporters, um, and I hope this continues to be the case, are driven by uh, that old fashioned competitive instinct to get the story, get the story first and be smart. You know, I, I, I do think, you know, That, 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 that's the ideal, obviously. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think in practice, you see it more often uh, than people realize. And you don't see it as often as, as, as we should. You know, I, I do think there are certain politicians that have gotten an easier ride from uh, journalists. But, um, but I'm not sure, to be honest, whether it's, it's because the journalist is biased. But, you know, people love John McCain. It's just yeah. like an example from our past. Reporters love John McCain. John McCain got great coverage because John McCain knew how to talk to journalists. I like John McCain. He was a fun person to talk to, and therefore he got great coverage. I mean, in 2000, yeah. the Gore campaign thought the press was biased against them because the press people just didn't like Gore, and they happened to – Bush joked around with them, and they liked Bush, right? Um, yeah, so, of course. So it was, it was like a personal thing, right? Yeah, I mean, it's – you know, this is a human business, and, and, yeah. and, and, and so human faults come into it, but this is where – I do think there's an importance, you know, that institutional values come into play here that, you know, we have to make it clear to journalists what we expect from them. And we spend a lot of time on that. There's a lot of you know time spent on internal training. Um, you know, we do vet stories very closely. Uh, uh, are we perfect? No. Are others perfect? Certainly not. Um, but I do think that there is still a tradition in American journalism that you're trying to be fair. And, uh, and it's more of something you would associate, I think, with print journalism um, uh, than with other media, with other sort of media. By the way, have you ever seen you Journeys? Know, have you ever seen the documentary Journeys with George by Alexander Pelosi? I have not. So this is a documentary by, you know, the I believe the daughter of Nancy Pelosi, who's obviously not a Republican. Um, right. And it's about uh, it's about the George W. Bush campaign of 2000. And it's like super favorable to george bush um really and i think she just like kind of fell for him um like he's a personal guy and she just enjoyed hanging out with him and yeah. uh you know she was on the plane covering him and it was it's a very very favorable uh thing yeah but i think you know i do think sort of readers and serious readers serious viewers um like we're not trying to kind of attain a perfect standard of objectivity I would think what we're always looking for more in journalism is sort of an authority. Yeah. You know, that you trust the person that either you're watching or reading, that they've done the work, they've properly thought it through, they're honest with you about what they know. They could be even honest about their biases. You know, there's actually very, a lot of great magazine reporting, which uh, doesn't sort of 
is not written in, in, in that voice of that sort of godlike voice of the, yeah. the New York Times from 1965. And then, but then you can see, even if, if you think the, the writer takes a certain position, they are sharing you enough information and are letting you make up your mind for, your, for yourself. And uh, that's what I would actually most wish for, that people are finding the work engaging and interesting and credible. And, and not sort of ideologically perfect. Um, you know, for us, it actually is very important to make sure that, that we're uh, hitting both sides equally or being, you know, fair with both sides equally. Um, but even when I you know, obviously consume a lot of journalism from other places, I ultimately, what I want to get from, from the media is you want to be smarter about the world around you and you want to understand something better. And there are many different ways to achieve that. So. Now, like the dog that's, story. That's the higher calling. Yeah. Like the Dobbs story, like mo well, many of your best stories come from leaks. How do you think about leakers in general? I mean, it's your job to basically get people to do things that they're not really supposed to do. I mean, it's, uh, I think it's part of uh, their, their public service is to sort of help us. Uh, do good journalism. <laughs> um, look, I mean, leakers going back eternity are, 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 are part of uh, life in a democracy. Um, yeah. And um you know, people who work in government will tell you, you know, there's, there's, there, there, there's many different motivations to share information. Um, I think, um, and there are some, some of them are actually very noble uh, uh, motivations, you know, they, uh, like a lot of leakers don't, first of all, don't see themselves as being leakers. I mean, it's rare that you get a Dobbs like thing. Here's yep. a document or here's Edward Snowden, who I think it's, a traitor or a hero you know that, that's more of a political but but that's very rare that just get a dump of here is something that you shouldn't have um what this usually comes out of and the reason why i think we get a lot of exclusives is because we have a lot of people who build up very close relationships with people in power and that is the job of a reporter in washington or for that matter any uh political capital and by um you know you when you build a relationship, it's not like you have one conversation. I, I had a colleague who used to cover the Pentagon who over 25 years called the same person in the Pentagon every single day. Most of the time it's just kind of shoot the, you know, shoot the shit, uh, what's going on? How is, you know, Bill Cohen doing? Did you yeah. see that, what Clinton did? And sometimes it got to be sort of quite, quite, quite substantive. And I think if you're in government, I do think it's important to have relationships with the media who cover you because you do want, a more perfect form of information to get you out. want to shape the you story want, yeah you want to shape the story but you want to say i mean you're sort of saying how frustrated reading about yourself i would you know in by my journalist i would say well then you know i think you or and should choose i trust these three journalists and these are journalists that i'm going to have a relationship with that i'm going to kind yeah. of be honest to sometimes or you know just have lunch with them or 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 sometimes you know you kind of you can work a story uh, i think good journalists uh um there are many, many great journalists, and they do work closely with sources to get things right. I think journalists who cover the government need the access to understand what's going on. And then for a democracy to function, people have to understand what their damn government's doing, you know? And, and, uh, and uh, I, 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 I can think of very few leaks that were sort of actually damaging. Ultimately, you know, things that get out should probably get out and are in the public interest, not just because the government overclassifies things a secret that actually shouldn't be secret because you know taxpayers deserve to know I, ultimately that, that's the way that i i, I think about it. now some some of your colleagues at other newspapers and news organizations have gotten dinged from you know sometimes putting unpopular opinions and on the, the opinion pages and stuff like that some of them have even gotten fired because of they've had internal rebellions and stuff i imagine like just being a newspaper person and actually just trying to stick to, hey, we're going to actually do news. And if uh, a, um, a, a, a senator or a respected person wants to write an opinion and we think the opinion is interesting, we're going to publish it. Um, I imagine that's actually like much harder to do today than it was 30 years ago. Um, have you felt some of those like same pressures? I think I may know which case you are referring to. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, Yes, I think we've all, look, 
maybe worries me more about the, the, than the state of journalism itself, which I think is ultimately quite healthy. And if we continue to figure out good business models to support independent journalism, journalism could continue to thrive. Um, but the other thing that you need for journalism to thrive is a healthy respect for free speech on both sides. And um, I, I do worry about, you know, if people in newsrooms, um, people actually, frankly, in general in public life are afraid to have honest conversations about the most important subjects before the country or their community, uh, then it becomes very hard to actually, you know, be a successful publisher of, of a publication, but also it becomes very hard to kind of live in a society which is free. It has been for, you know, well over two centuries. Um, and, uh, I think that's a, I, I do think the case you're referring to obviously is a Tom Cotton one in, um, in 2020. Uh, that was a unique moment in, in American, or 2021, sorry. Uh, um, no, 2020, it was, it was the, the yeah. sort of summer episode of 2020. Um, that was a uniquely tense moment in, in the US and I think in that, in that newsroom. And I would hope that a lot of people who worked in that newsroom think about it differently some people have come out and said they were sorry uh about uh what they did at that moment you know there were some mea culpas not from the very top at the new york times but but there were some mea culpas um about you know we we really went too far um i don't know how to run a publication uh without um protecting free speech and having spent a lot of my life you know i used to edit an op-ed section um for uh, a bunch of years at the Wall Street Journal, um, there's nothing I enjoyed putting out there more than a uh, controversial opinion. I mean, responsible, fine, yeah. interesting, well, well, well put together. You know, whether it was from the left, from the right. You know, that's the whole point of an opinion section. It's, it's like a public square. Uh, uh, and if you're saying that that voice is not allowed and that voice is not allowed, what that leads and impoverishes the square. Um, because the people who are making the decisions start to worry about their careers. And so you have self-censorship and I, uh, you know, having been raised in uh, the Eastern Bloc, I, um, I, I don't really want our papers to be turned into Pravda. <laughs> I think above all, because they're really boring. It's actually bad for, uh, I think it's bad for journalism. You know? yeah. People should have to sort of hear other points of view and, and, and have fun with ideas. I mean, that's really what a opinion well, section that, especially should be doing. And that particular incident happened kind of as, as like, you know, in kind of peak COVID times. Um, and right. and there was a lot of censorship, maybe self-censorship in COVID, um, people censoring different theories about where COVID came from, censoring other types of things in COVID. In retrospect, some news organizations say, hey, wait, they wish they didn't do this or they shouldn't have done that or they, mm -hmm. they gave into a little bit too much pressure from government and stuff like that. Because I imagine in times of crisis, you're much more likely if government's like, "Hey, don't don't publish this," it's gonna you know get people all jittery. You're gonna be less likely to to do those types of things. How do you think, as news organizations, we should think of like when to censor, how to censor, etc.? Well, first of all, um, that definitely did happen, and um, and the only kind of antidote to it, in a sense, is to talk about it openly and. And, and reflect, you know, I think some of the great uh, news organizations have pretty strong ombudsmen, um, you know, have good uh, editors who are responsible for, you know, setting and enforcing standards. And because we're not perfect, uh, as we discussed earlier, you know, this is a human business and we're fairly flawed. And until chat, chat GPT can not only get its facts straight, but also can go out there and start reporting stuff like we're <laughs> to, uh, to having sort of humans. <laughs> do this kind of work um uh it also comes back you know can we uh i i do worry that it's harder to have honest conversations in america as such and certainly in american newsroom so um you know and and, and self-censorship doesn't come from a directive from someone in my position it, it comes from sort of all sorts of indirect pressures that people may even be misreading yep you know um or, you know, I 
that. And this with reporters of certain politicians, you write a negative story about them, you have three days of uh, hate on Twitter. Do you really want to put yourself through that? Or would yeah, you good do point. some other story, you know? Uh, I don't think there's a kind of conspiracy to kind of silence things. I think it's mo mostly that, that the culture we live in is now less hospitable to, um, uh, to a truly honest uh, uh, conversation about what's, what's going on. There's a lot of screaming in this country these days, which I, I, I think uh, is, is probably the form of so social media, you know, that everyone's got a megaphone. Speaking of social media, there, there, there has been a lot of blame directed at these tech companies for rise of in misinformation, for increasing polarization, for division in society. Um, do you think there are things that these tech companies could do to make things better in society, or do you think they are what they are? You know, I can only... You know, sorry, before I was saying, like, uh, we're not technologists, we should be journalists, we should be best at sort of doing sort of at least, you know, at sort of journalism and being clear about the kind of journalism we do. Um, the tech platforms, to me, still are ultimately tech platforms, you know, and, and uh, but uh, they're also publishers of a lot, a lot of content. And um, it's hard to imagine for me, um, I know people have debated this for, for years, and this is where I don't know as much as Kara Swisher and dozens and dozens of, of other kind of journalists who really kind of grew up in that world. I guess you could say if, you know, if Facebook spent more money on content moderation instead of um, uh, trying to hook, you know, sort of teenagers on, on certain kinds of uh, uh, sort of content, uh, we might be in a better place. Um, but if it wasn't Facebook, it'd be someone else. You know, you can only control the world so much. And, um, you know, ultimately there has to be a response which starts with having open conversations about this. Politicians come into it, and even though they're very, very, very slow. Um, and and we try and, like everything in American life, you know, you sort of were pretty good at correcting mistakes and, and there were sort of excesses done by tech companies that politicians should try and address, but I, I, I'm not sure what the magic solution is. I, I don't know, Warren, I mean, actually, it's, this is your area, it's, I mean, much more than, than mine. I'm kind of curious what you think should have been done differently. Um, and this is not I, a cop-out, this is more a, yeah, a, yeah. a mission of yeah. sort of... Uh... I, I, I don't know, and I'm not sure that, like, I'm not sure that the that social media is worse than TV news. Um, so it's not clear to me Though some people say social media drives TV news, it, it's it's not clear to me that 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 it, it just could be a reflection of society. Yeah, I mean the world is where is the world now? I mean, I think a lot of things like misinformation, disinformation, used to be called propaganda. You know, we used to pump uh, radio waves into the Soviet Union to tell them stuff, and they used to sort of try and send it back and leaflet and spread misinformation going back decades. So, a lot of what we're talking about is not new. Um, what is new is the volume level and just the sort of the scale of all this. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, I think that's what people probably find so disorienting. And, um, you know, a world where you needed to be able to afford a, a printing press and a fleet of trucks and a bunch of kids on bicycles to be a publisher of news. Uh, in some ways, it was a much simpler world. And, and maybe it actually was a better world in terms of you know, having people kind of uh, be able to process what's going on around them in a, uh, at least we're just sort of so just, everything's coming at you. It's like you're, you're on a, um, some kind of, um, you know, amphetamine or something, you know, uh, with, with, with just sort of this sort of deluge of it. And, uh, but uh, there certainly is no magic fix for that, uh, unless you want to, uh, you know, undo the internet and under the last 25 years. There seems to be a rise in the U.S. of preference falsification where people are saying things that they don't actually believe in, both on the left and the right. Um, it seems to be much more prevalent today than it, than it has been in the past. Obviously, people never completely speak their mind. That would be you know, crazy. Um, everyone self-censors a bit. Um, but it seems to be quite high, and you know, I, I know that you 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 have experience growing up in a um, in a communist country that that did a lot of those types of things. Um, uh, like, do you does that make it harder to be a journalism because you, you, 
people are con constantly or they or at least when they get behind and closed doors they can actually tell you the truth yeah it makes it um certainly more sort of challenging and i definitely i think it's it's uh you know because politicians being a politician is now primarily being a kind of media figure to a certain degree whether that was any kind of small part of it and even the ones who are the most anti-media like you know ron DeSantis, are actually sort of that their the media is almost everything for for that yep. um so to kind of get a uh I do think on the other side of things, and, and this is what is, uh, you know, you can kind of depress yourself about the state of journalism, the state of sort of media, but um, when you look really hard closely at it, a couple of things that I see is um, in a country where there's people are incredibly well educated, want to be well informed, people are searching for quality sources of information. People do identify uh, either certain journalists or certain figures or certain institutions. Uh, they support them with their time or or, or with their money. Um, and that was my experience again, as I was, I was only a kid in the Eastern Bloc, but you know, um, my grandparents used to listen to Radio Free, Free Europe, you know, uh, very quietly in the corner of, of their house to know what was really happening in their country. You sort of, you actually even more want to know what's going on. I don't think that People are not less well informed than they used to be. They're probably much better in in informed. Yeah, they're much they more much informed. Easier, yeah, they have much easier access to actually credible sources of information, to primary uh, sources of information as well. There are all these studies that the the more educated people are, the more they they have access to news, the more partisan they become. Um, and uh, <laughs> I guess you don't really have time to make up your. You, your mind because you're always processing uh, <laughs> you know what's sort of coming at you uh you know it's um yeah no get, from your from I, your standpoint as a journalist what do you think are the big stories the big issues that not enough people are talking about today i think we are living through an era of a, in a very sort of fundamental change in uh, in our economy and in the way we work. Uh, in that, I was I think sort of my kids will have a very different professional life than I've had, and I guess we don't probably don't talk enough about how to prepare people for the, for this kind of world. To, to your point, that things are sort of changing so quickly. There is so much coming at us. Um, I I do. Uh, for all the stories about you know polarization in America, um, uh, and and which uh, and for all the attention that politicians get, frankly, um, you know the things you think about, especially as a parent, is uh, how, how do you prepare your kids for for the world that's coming? You know that uh, even with sort of Chat GPT, which is now getting so much attention, you know I never heard of it until about six months ago. You know, sort of vaguely heard about it, and 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 this is something which has come so quickly, and has such far-reaching implications, um, and is probably going to do to our, I mean, my industry and our economy what the, you know, the digital revolution of the late twentieth century did at the time. Um, how do you think? How do you? How, what, what do you think it is going to do to the industry? I think like other tools in the past, it should um, make us more efficient, uh, first of all. It, uh, if we're kind of creative, we should be better at what we do by using it, you know, we already start thinking about, you know, can we organize our data? We've got a lot of archives, we, yep. we deal with a lot of, um, you know, sort of documents coming at us. Yeah, uh, data, the data journalism, like it, it should, be journalism. Able, should be able to do data some of that better. For, 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 for sure. But even I think you can imagine, you know, some of the more rote functions that mm. um, uh, now currently some of these m must do. You know, I, I would love to have someone who does like SEO, uh, uh, like uh, pro probably artificial intelligence would be yeah. better at sort of uh, search engine optimization than uh, a, a, a sort of someone. It's, we it's interesting because one of, one of the things that, that um, one of the things that that chat GPT does very well is like summarizes things. And if you think of there's been like entire article, entire uh, publications like Axios that are literally just like summaries of stuff. It's like, hey, here's a bunch of here's you don't have time to read this whole thing. Here's a good summary in like yeah. five bullet points. 
Like that is something that uh, that chat GPT probably is going to do a really good job of. I think that, I think we want to use it, uh, you know, again, you use Google or spell check now. I think, you know, even sort of, it's actually very good at uh, headlines and oh, it's, yeah. it's pretty good at, you know, I was playing around with, uh, or a friend, friend of mine was sort of playing around with the uh, names for a newsletter. Uh, it was about uh, some, some, some future of work topic and chat GPT came up with actually better suggestions for, for, for possible names for it. So, mm. um, and it's, and it's very, very early on. I, I don't, I mean, like any technology in the past, I still have to believe that it'll uh, at the, and this is not going to be undestructive, obviously, but at that kind of lower end of the kind of uh, scale scale, it, it, it'll make things, um, well, it'll take that part over, but then it would hopefully let people focus on, on where you can add more value. And still, it, 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 it could, it could actually it. hit the other side. There could be a lot of things on the lower end that are very hard. If you think of like, AI is not like it, it hasn't yet replaced like the waiters and stuff. And uh, you would think that that's where the robots would have come first is replacing the waiters in the restaurants, but like it could actually replace the doctors. Right. Um, yeah. Or it could make it, you know, make it sort of that we have uh, more specialists and some of the sort sure. of general practitioner stuff is handled by, you know, having AI or having, you know, being sort of, sort of identify problems much earlier than, than you would by talking to the to your GP, you know, right, right now and, and through both testing, well, well, testing, obviously. So now what um, uh, random question for you, what, what conspiracy theories do you think are true? Uh, well, I know you have one that I, that I now happen to believe is true. <laughs> can I, can I share that one? Sure. Do you know what it is? I don't know, but you and I have had many discussions over the years. So, uh, and I love, okay. I love hearing conspiracy theories. I'm not even sure if I still believe this one, but I love repeating conspiracy theories. So this is the one actually I do think is true because I kind of convinced myself it's a bit self-serving. So uh, it's your conspiracy. Theory. There's a conspiracy against Gen X. Okay. That, 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 that we are this sort of generational cohort, which is squeezed in, uh, we're, 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 we're the smallest one. Yep. We're squeezed in between these sort of entitled, needy boomers who are our parents. Uh, and then on the other end, you have that sort of bulge of uh, millennials who are also entitled uh, and, and needy in, in their own ways. Uh, we're probably we're not like the middle child, the, right? We, we, we don't middle get the child of generations. We won't get the president. See, most likely, you know, we um, and yet we are carrying the burden of of. Uh, we are carrying a disproportionate share of the burden in American uh, professional and uh, society as such. And you think there's a there's a good chance that like the presidency never hits Gen X to so just um, like, you know, it almost skipped the, the silent generation, like somehow Biden still slipped in and got the <laughs> and, and got like so that was a generation that almost never got. They had got McCain it. and Mondale and many other, you know, people who try, but they 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 finally slipped in with 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 Biden. You 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 could see a scenario where Generation X doesn't get the presidency, or you know they get this eighty year old presidency in in many years from now. Um, imagine Ethan Hawke running for president one day. Uh, I think that yeah. would be uh, uh, he'd be the perfect uh, representative of our generation. Um, he was in Gattaca, right? I mean, that's a perfect uh, <laughs> scenario. <laughs> And, and do you do you think that there's a like a like a structural thing of of why do you think and these generations and is these gener is is the generation X it doesn't seem like it's hit other places. There's been generation X prime ministers in um in the UK. There's gener there's generation X president in um in um in in um in in France. There's there's a, it doesn't seem like it's hit other places. Like it's hit the U.S. You know, I actually think we might get a president. I think I think there's a conspiracy against us that way. But I think we don't get enough attention, and uh, if, I, if I may say so, credit for 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 the. Um, and this is more of a middle-aged man sort of, yeah. sort of uh, uh, cry, right? You know that we we are generations X is at a stage is at its in its evolution, so to speak. Um, where it is carrying kind of the weight of the two other generations. So, uh, and we're small, 
you know, and, and we're also kind of have no great cultural markers. I don't think reality bites really counts as uh, <laughs> kind of, uh, and, and we don't get that, that much attention, you know, think about how much attention is, is given to the boomers uh, and, and their music and their impact in politics. And then, and then, you know, it, it kind of just, things just kind of passed us over and suddenly the, the millennials are, are sort of the, you know, with sort of Gen Zers, maybe they're going to be big enough to kind of, uh, stake some claim to this territory, but the millennials are also now, because of the way they are, you know, that, um, uh, because we were also raised in a time of recession. It was just yep. the time after the, um, uh, the, the first Gulf War, um, uh, and, and the boomers are the ones that kind of benefited from that sort of great uh, prosperity of the sort of 90s and, and, and so on. And then uh, uh, I, I think, and then the millennials kind of missed that. You know, the millennials sort of came in a time of plenty and 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 sort of act like it. So uh, that, that's where I think that's where I, th I think that, that I do, do think you are right about. about so in some ways, like we had it slightly easier than the millennials in terms of like because if you're born in the '70s, it, you know, or even the late '60s, '70s, most ge like Generation X, you were born at a time where the, the, you were born with a very low population. Um, so if you were applying to college. Um, it was much easier yes. to get into college um, than than it is that it was for the millennials, where they just had weight. Because obviously, it, at the millennials, they were just like it was like twice as many people, maybe even sometimes five times as many people applying to elite colleges. Um, and then you also had people internationally who are applying as well. And then it just seems like just getting some of these like more elite jobs has become more competitive as well. So they, they maybe have a maybe maybe there's something about the millennials where they've had to be a little scrappier um, too to to get ahead. Yeah, they actually, they have a sort of high opinion of themselves as a result. I think I'm, I think I heard some of that. It was that the class of 1995 at Harvard that was the easiest year to get into Harvard. Yep, and, that's right. Yeah, because yeah. they, they, that means they were born on 73, which was basically the lowest birth year as a percentage. Point. Yeah, I think I think someone that we both know is sort of joking. Well, that explains why I got in. <laughs> this this person's probably in line for a Nobel Prize, so I, I <laughs> <laughs> probably deserve to get in. But, <laughs> um, uh, you know, that, that's definitely true. But uh, I also having kind of kids who are now college bound, the other change you sort of seen, I do think that this decline in the trust in institutions has also kind of coincided in a decline in the importance of institutions. That um, yes, it's harder than ever to get into college. And then I would um, probably make the argument that it's less important than it was in the past where you would go to college. Like in the 1950s, 80%, um, it was uh, Yale had about an 80% acceptance rate. And um, and these kids were mostly kids of alums. There was a quota system for Jews for uh, public school kids. And getting into Yale in 1950 assured that you had a, probably a 50 year, you know, pretty much great career on Wall Street or as, as a lawyer. Whereas that's not true anymore. You know, you can you can, yeah. you can uh, I think I think we've sort of seen the deinstitutionalization of so many things that that that, that now I, 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 I that's that's just not as I mean, there's an upside to not having these sort of social, um, you know, arbiters the way that media used to be like, we filter for you what's important. Now people can say, no, I'm going to find out my, myself. The way that higher education institutions used to kind of filter for business, business now can either find people in, in various ways, or you can just, you know, uh, create a great startup and, 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 and be on your way, you know. You just don't need that that's a that I think that's a very positive change that 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 has come even if it's come at the cost of you know declining public trust in our institutions i actually don't think that's a so thing. why do you think it it i agree with you that these elite colleges are actually like they're actually less valuable really today than they than they've ever been um yes. in many in in but it does seem like parents spend way more time trying to get their kids into them than they've ever have in the past. So they're putting, the parents are putting way more value on these elite institutions than they were um, 40 years ago. Yet the value of these elite institutions seem to be a lot lower than they were. So why is this happening? Why, uh, why, why is it's, there- It's a status like, symbol, right? I mean- Well, uh, sure, yeah. 
Yeah. Your friends, your kid goes to Stanford. They're, they're, right. They're, it's a, uh, okay. Uh, right. Bigger, so, bigger flex. Yeah. So is that? The, I mean, to me, that's probably the answer. Is that you're you're not allowed to brag that you're the editor of Politico or that I have a nice house or you know these things. You, you just can't brag about these things anymore. But you you are still very much allowed to brag if your kid goes to Harvard. Like that is, in fact, <laughs> if you meet someone whose kid goes to Harvard, they will tell you within twenty seconds of meeting them. Um, guaranteed that they will tell you. <laughs> I, I wonder if there's a broader reason for that. I, 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 um, I mean, for for the for the sort of decline in importance of, of of these institutions. I think that part of it too is that um, the move away from um, and I'm not a great fan of standardized testing that they they tell you um, how good you are at taking the test. At the same time, it does it 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 made admission to these schools, whether it's law school or undergrad. Um, more competitive and probably more meritocratic and as that has changed i've heard employers tell me that then they they actually um rely less on the harvard admissions office doing the kind of first pass for them at who should be recruited for um, for top jobs you know top entry level jobs coming in and i think that change which is uh something um not related to what we we're talking about. I, I think that is also uh, changing perceptions of, of these schools. All right, this has been great. Last question we ask all of our guests, what conventional wisdom or advice do you think is generally bad advice? Um, I'd say that um, hard work is the key to success. I, um, I don't think, I think that's obviously something you hear and, um, I would never tell my kids, by the way, they should not be working hard in school. So I think I think I hope they're not uh, listening to this podcast. I think they are. Yeah. School, uh, but uh, in this is part of my sort of um, you know the anti grit, uh, anti grind. Uh, I think you know it's just hard work comes from inspiration or having a, an amazing idea. And I think in America we do uh, overly. Um, glorify you know the grind and and i i think that the grind is both sort of uh, soul soul killing but kind of brain killing and uh what what's so bad about it like what is like as as someone who was a grinder and still is a grinder like what what's so what's so wrong about it like yeah but you're a grinder at things that you're great at and you're a grinder at things that you love doing. Uh, I, 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 I imagine. I think you know. So, so the inspiration, the kind of the, the love of what you're doing, the sort of taking the time to figure out what you want to do, and then uh, uh, sort of getting it done. Uh, that's that's more important. And, and hard work in and of itself, there is no joy in that unless it's connected to an inspired idea or um, uh, I think some sort of passion. And because like it does seem, at least to me, when I if I think of all the people I met in my teens and my twenties, it seems like the people who worked the hardest on this random project at school or worked the hardest in some random thing, you know, in their first couple of years at work, like those were the ones who ended up being the most successful people. Um, it was literally like the raw number of hours that they put in and they and that they they cared about. And didn't slack off. At least those. At least, at least I, that's what I've seen. But you disagree. I would say, think about Michael Jordan. I'm sure there were many other players in his generation who spent as much time in the gym, or uh, or worked as hard as Michael Jordan. Uh, and there was only one Michael Jordan. Of course. And I think yeah. that that became because he identified a passion and a, and a drive for something, which in his case was, uh, you know, being competitive winning being very regular sports and basketball and then worked super hard as well or yeah. you could you could i bet you could say something else i bet you yeah, there talent. are some i bet you there are some other people who got to the nba on the talent but they didn't become michael jordan because they didn't work as hard as him um and yes. care as much about it so it's very possible there could have been other michael jordans um, if they, you know, if, if you think of the work after, you know, and, and, and Kobe Bryant is famous for his like insane work after, you know, uh, uh, or, or LeBron James or something like, you know, these guys just work so hard at their craft 
And it's very possible that there could have been other people who are also in the, obviously they were innately, they're innately talented, but who had some innate talent, but who never achieved the Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant status because they didn't work as hard. Well, I can guarantee that if I worked as hard as Kobe Bryant, um, I could still uh, uh, not win five uh, NBA championships. Well, well that's um, right. That, I agree with that. You have to, so, you have to have some sort of innate talent as well. Yes. <laughs> I may have. And, and I can't say that I think people that either my profession or around who are successful, I wouldn't say they're purely the kind of the, they would win the Russians to call it this, the kind of prize, you know, this is a prize for the factory worker who's was a hero factory worker who, you know, was a worker. I don't think the kind of stakhanovites of our world are the ones who are, um, who are kind of re remaking it, you know, and, and, uh, I don't think that's sort of hard work. Hard work is essential, obviously, but is yeah. it the key? I, I would say, I would say it's not the key. Like hard work should actually very naturally flow from hmm. um, an inspired idea or an innate talent or uh, something that actually we uh, come to um, uh, in, 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 in some way that kind of gives you space to, to identify. I think you know, I'll give you a small example here in, in, in our operation. I, I think you probably spend a little bit too little time just kind of taking a deep breath, thinking about what we're doing, trying to think of how can we do this differently? How can we do it creatively? That we kind of fall in this, um, I, th I think the hamster wheel can be uh, uh, both just deadening, but also kind of actually sort of, dis sort of bad. So it can, can actually sort of undermine what you're trying to do in um, whether it's a creative enterprise or, 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 or anything kind of more purely commercial enterprise. I actually think I think very few white collar workers work forty hours a week, um, work even that much. Because I I think they I think some white collar workers need to work eighty hours to get a good forty hours. Um, so to actually get the forty hours out there, but there's you know plenty of people that work forty but actually produce you know they're not really working so they're, they're really they really only have like 25 or something or 20 um and so if you can get a good 40 out of someone i think that's amazing but it's pretty rare to get a good 40 out of out of a particular person i mean people who probably work the hardest are probably at the lower end of our pay scales in in this that's country. right so, uh, th those people are working hard they are working I mean, really worked, hard i've never yeah. felt i worked harder than when i did you know, when I worked as a ballet parker in sort of restaurants or, or, or in the yeah, when you're on the clock, when people are paying you by the hour, then they want to get the most out of your hour. And they're often working pretty, pretty hard when you're getting paid by the year, then people start to uh, change how they work often. Yeah. But I think this is also where leisure is for so many of our, of what we do, that is such an important time to, to sure. be able to carve. And it's so hard because there's so much, pressure to work hard and there's just so much to do but you know i, I think you know, for so many jobs actually reading a book and sitting on the beach is is part of the job you know? that's true uh, that's a good point so anyway, so. as 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 uh or having uh drinks with your source or something uh exactly. yeah. all right this has been amazing thank you matt kaminsky for joining us world of das i follow you at Minsky MK on Twitter. I definitely encourage our listeners to engage with you there and really appreciate you being on with us. Thanks, Oren. This is really great to be with you.